All right, good evening. Welcome to the 2023 Naturally Speaking series, live from the floor of the Virginia Living Museum in Newport News. We are uh, honored to be here tonight for a different kind of presentation, a film screening. So we're gonna do first some really quick housekeeping tidbits. We've got an audience here at the museum and an audience uh, also on Zoom. The live portion tonight is recorded. You uh, will see the museum go on mute during the actual film screening. The Zoom audience will receive the link to the film to click at home in their chat box. Uh, questions can be asked and put into the question box at home. You can upvote those questions uh, by simply using the thumbs up in the queue box and uh, we'll host a question and answer session at the end of the film. So that's housekeeping. Send a note to us if I confused you at home in Zoom land. All right, tonight we get a unique glimpse on the art and science of nature because Jeff Bodecker has spent a life uh, creating that. Jeff's a film director and a writer who founded Orange Frame Productions in Richmond in 2015. Uh, that's after some pretty impressive work, National Geographic, uh, Smithsonian, um, Discovery Channel, Science Channel, PBS, History Channel. Jeff has a master's degree in filmmaking from Boston University. Uh, he's an active member of the Writers Guild of America. Jeff's mission is to advance stories about science and natural history to be more relevant, relatable, as well as thought provoking. Jeff, please come up here and introduce our, your film, Ocean Invaders. All right, thank you. Um, Thank you to the Virginia Living Museum for hosting me and hosting this uh, screening. It's special for us. Every time we get to see a live audience, watch our work, it's, it's not usually how it happens. So uh, we're excited that you're here. Um, this, about this time last year, we were in production. Uh, we were in production all through spring and into a summer, then edited in summer, and it premiered uh, on PBS on the Novo Science series in October. Uh, so um, it's about, I'm just going to say some really quick and then I'll let the film speak for itself. Uh, you know, invasive species, it's a word that you hear all the time. Um, we know that they can be highly destructive, but, you know, why is that? And, uh, you know, we have ecosystems that have, that seem, they've been evolving for millions of years. They're hardy, they're strong. So why is it that one, you know, new bug or new animal can completely cripple you know, an entire system, like the lionfish. So we use an iconic, we, um, well, this is actually a nest of a uh, Asian giant hornet, but the, there we go. So the lionfish is a great iconic invasive for its origins, for how it spread and what it's doing and what people are doing to control it. So uh, we follow the story of the lionfish to reveal the science behind invasions of our natural world and hope you enjoy the film. I think you hit your mark. Relevant, relatable, thought provoking. You did it. <laughs> uh, I have to admit, I did not see the jewelry coming. Uh, that was a surprise. Um, and if I can, Jeff, start with the first question. To make a film like that, you're obviously in the water a lot, and you're also obviously out of the water a lot because there was probably a lot of film um, reels that you had to go through. What, what percentage of time, if you could think about the whole scope of the film, were you in the water compared to out of the water when you're making a film like this? Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, so that's a good question. Underwater filmmaking is um, incredibly difficult for um, so many reasons. One, I mean, you, you saw from scenes with the dive boats, all the equipment that's involved, 
all the limitations involved. Um, there we go. So, I, you know, and also, you know, with any nature documentary, when you're filming, you don't know what you're actually going to capture. Uh, however, when it's underwater and uh, it's very difficult to scout or really know what's what's happening under there. Um, a lot of times we were kind of fishing as we went down. So the footage probably that was underwater is actually a minority, maybe 10 to 15 percent of everything we shot. Uh, there is a lot of I mean, that's including the uh, the subject matter experts who are usually professors, scientists at the Smithsonian who you hear giving context and uh, a lot was drawn from from those interviews. So. Um, I can show you actually, I think we have a couple behind the scenes pictures. Um, so you can see here, this was the host, Danny. Um, this is one of uh, the, the survey, fish survey. And, you know, on the boat, this is our cinematographer, that's this image stabilizer. So we actually, it was kind of a mistake because when we got back to the edit suite and we have Francesco here, who's our editor and also Elizabeth, who is our associate producer, could have been done, made without them. Productions are always big team efforts, but because it kept it so stable, the footage actually looks unnatural on a boat because you have, uh, you know, the horizon that's exactly still and a boat is moving, which is, you know, not the perspective. So we had to do some tricks, but, um, but we didn't know when we went down. In fact, um, one time, um, one of the dives with the spearfisher scene, uh, we dove in. We were told that there was artificial reef down there, and uh, the anchor was close to it. So myself and the primary underwater cinematographer uh, went down first because we wanted to capture the B-roll that you see. B-roll is just general footage that you can place anywhere throughout of lionfish. You know, it's this way we can place it throughout. A bunch of them congregated around this artificial reef. So we get down there, and um, at first it's just completely sandy, and we have trouble finding it. And then we find the structure, and we're very confused because there's not one lionfish there. And uh, somebody had come the day before and said, you know, it's filled with them, just like the shots that you may have be, have seen with a bunch of them congregated. So we kind of kept looking around, circling around, maybe. We didn't know what was going on. And then the spear fishermen, they came down, you know, they descended and they immediately looked at each other and it just, you know, went back up. And we knew immediately at that point something wasn't right. So we followed them back up. And it turns out there was one of those lionfish derbies, the tournaments that was taking place. And somebody had marked that spot and that day had cleared out probably, you know, 30 to 50 lionfish a couple hours before we had arrived. So you know, it's, it's expensive to be on the water for production. It's challenging, like I said. So we um, rushed to this other site that they knew and ended up getting some of the shots, other shots that you saw in, uh, in the film. Yeah, so the question is about how the topic became of interest to make a film about it. And uh, back in 2018, we were actually doing a film about shipwrecks. And I knew very little about lionfish, nothing about them as invasive. And uh, during our dives, there was a guy with one of the tubes and spear fishing, and I was so focused on the job and filming the shipwrecks that we were doing. And um, it, it was only kind of later where I started to like wonder why this guy was tagging along and why he was spearing all these fish. And then looking at the fish, they were beautiful. And uh, so that was also kind of confusing too. And it wasn't like, you know, typical fish you would harvest for food. So um, I started asking questions and one thing led to another. And then once I heard, you know, heard the story that there were zero lionfish, you know, throughout Florida in the Atlantic in the 80s. And now in some places on the coast, it's the second most populous fish. It has in some places 40% of the total fish biomass, which is like weight, you know, of a fish within just three decades. I'm like, well, how does that happen? And this is not, you know, it's all happening underwater. So it's kind of out of sight, out of mind compared to maybe if the murder hornets, you know, suddenly start showing up in our backyard. I think we'd pay more attention to that. But it was also just like, you know, I mean, the Atlantic ecosystem has been here for uh, millions of years. It's a strong, thriving ecosystem with biodiversity. The animals are hardy. So what is it that this one fish can arrive and um, 
totally disrupt everything. So, uh, and that just kind of started, started the journey to figure out what's going on. Like what's going on with the lights, <laughs> shorter journey. <laughs> so uh, the question was about how we pre-budget and not really knowing where we're gonna go. And the honest answer is that a lot of times the budget uh, dictates uh, where we can go and what we can do. Uh, in this particular case, it was PBS Nova uh, national broadcast. So we had um, good funding for, for a documentary and because of the circumstances of chartering boats and underwater cinematography and all that. Uh, but in the case of production, just a quick timeline, you know, this was pitched about eight months before to PBS Nova before the gears actually started moving. So typically when we develop shows, uh, it's about six months in advance that we're putting it in front of a client distribution company. And then from there, the talks start happening. And fortunately with Nova, um, they were really uh, trusting and hands-off during the filmmaking process. They uh, had a lot of notes in post-production. Uh, there was a lot of hard decisions that were made, but um, you know, typically that's about the cycle is three, six months from pitch to contract. From there, it's off to the races about three months of pre-production that's deep research, contacting experts, setting up shoots, another three months of shooting, maybe another four months of post-production, and then uh, you deliver it. And then that's how, in general, a lot of um, TV documentaries are made. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question is, have we tried introducing natural predators, which makes total sense. And that's what I was thinking when we first started too. It's like, well, and a, a very good example for lionfish, they're native to the South Pacific. Pacific giant grouper have been seen and eat lionfish. And actually, if you dive and explore, you know, out in the, the Pacific, you're not seeing them everywhere. It's just like, you know, a, a normal, ordinary fish. There's nothing really noteworthy besides them being beautiful. We have Atlantic giant grouper. You've seen them here and they can grow huge, uh, like the size, you know, of, of a person and uh, almost identical in, in how they are and how they behave in, in species. But the Atlantic giant grouper are not eating lionfish like the Pacific giant grouper are because you know, these, the Pacific giant grouper and the lionfish have co-evolved together. They've uh, they co-evolved with their environment, right? So they know in a sense, speaking in human terms, they, they know each other, right? So the Atlantic giant grouper doesn't know the lionfish. It doesn't know it's a food source. It's not going to risk it, right? And try to take a chomp out of it. And so it's like, well, then why don't we just take the Pacific giant grouper, a whole bunch of them and do the same thing that happened with the lionfish and drop them off the coast of, you know, uh, Daytona beach and see what happens. But that's the problem is nobody ever could predict that the lionfish was going to spread like most invasive species it's not out of malice it's these accidental uh, releases or hitchhikers and most of them die when you get a species from one side of the world to another side of the world they mostly just die because it's not their environment they can't survive but every once in a while it's like a lottery ticket every somebody's got to win and every once in a while like the lionfish it has these perfect characteristics where it just flourishes. so they're very apprehensive about bringing its native predators because they don't know what the effects, just like you can never predict the real effects of invasive species until it's too late. Uh, so if they bring the giant Pacific uh, grouper over, then who knows, they do their job, they eat the lionfish, and then what do they eat, you know? So, and that's, a, at least that's what the scientists told me makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so the question is about uh, the stigma behind invasive species and how it's almost like how we talk about them. It's almost like inherently they're this bad species. And uh, we were very conscientious of that because the lionfish is not bad because of what it is. It's bad because of where it is, right? And that goes for all invasive species. They're native to somewhere. And um, so we want to make, make sure that 
we know that they're they're not villains. It's actually us who wanted to have exotic fish in our bedrooms, you know, at some point because we could, you know, and at some point somebody had to move and didn't want to flush their fish or something and dropped them off. And then that's what spread it. So the fish isn't bad. It does devastating things, but it's just being a fish. And we want to make sure that it's doing probably, again, human thoughts, what every fish wishes it could do is expand, reproduce, eat, and continue that cycle over and over. So we wanted to, um, yeah, make, make sure of that. And, you know, we're giving these labels too. And one thing we discovered is invasive species, that's a human construct, right? Like we're the ones who are saying that, well, it's damaging this environment that we know of right now. But speaking with a lot of the scientists, if you think about the, wor the, the earth as far as millennia, millions of years, it, this is just a blip. So one of the scientists at the end said, you know, these things will balance themselves out. True, right? But at what cost? And that's, I think, what we, it's more of a thought, it's more of a philosophical question. At what cost are we willing to prevent or to help expedite uh, eradicating invasive species versus letting nature play its course? Because at some point, if the lionfish were to continue to spread, they would run out of food, right? So they would start starving or start eating each other, whatever. And at some point, there's, you know, we're talking a million years, we're talking 500 years, I don't know. But, you know, as far as right now, they're eating so many native juvenile fish. And what do we do about that? You know, I don't know. Uh, the question is if there's any medicinal uh, uses or uh, discoveries they found with lionfish and how, um, you know, in the film, it shows other, other uses besides um, eating them. And I don't know if any research has been done on that front. No, uh, no one spoke about that. Um, they spoke about how painful it was to get stung by them. <laughs> and that was, uh, you know, something we were always cognizant of when we were diving because they do blend in uh, very well. But uh, I think that'd be interesting. And I think that's what it, th ideas like that are probably what it's going to take because really at the end we discovered and we try to put at the end, that's probably going to be something like commercialization that's going to help manage lionfish, um, selling them. They're, they're delicious, you know, as f a food source. They're difficult to uh, fillet, but um, you know, just like the, the in Carousel, what they're doing with the local fish market. Um, hopefully, what they're trying to do in the Key West with those traps, the Giddings traps, they're hoping lobster fishermen, they're on such a tight, restricted schedule that they're hoping in the off season that they'll start harvesting lionfish instead and dropping these traps because it's much like fishing for lobster where you leave them for a week or two and you come back and collect them. So we'll see. Uh, yes. Yeah, we tried it several ways and it's a very delicious fish. It's neutral. If you eat fish, it's a very neutral fish. It's like sea bass. It's a smaller filet. Um, I uncomfortably tried it like right after it was filleted as sashimi. Our editor liked it. Uh, I was, I like it cooked. <laughs> or at least I don't like seeing it become sushi right in front of my face. <laughs> but um, it is if they could find a way to efficiently harvest and commercialize them, it would be a very popular fish. And that's just a problem. You saw the challenges. It's not like you can just troll with a net like shrimp. You can't get them with a hook, you know, like a lot of other fish. They don't school up like how you see. You have to, you have to spear them um, or develop a new method. And then even then, you know, the deep water ones are a totally different problem. That's right. So the question is about uh, the a uh, northern giant hornet that they've spotted and found nest in, in Washington in the segment in the film. So uh, it's, what is the thought process or how, um, how do we stop, you know, these kind of invasions that would be very significant. And it's just like uh, what one of the scientists said, you have to do it early on. There's a curve uh, with invasive species. And once it gets to a certain point, it's nearly impossible. Like the lionfish will not be eradicated. They can be managed, but they won't be eradicated. So we wanted to show the northern giant hornet, also known as a murder hornet, for 
several reasons. We want to get out of the water just to keep things moving from a cinematic film perspective. But we also wanted to show how early detection can work and does work. And they're doing a fantastic job in Washington, both people and the government and the uh, scientists there. Uh, so in Florida, there's an example of the, um, it was the African snail. And it was, it was introduced and uh, they actually eradicated it. And what they did was they threw millions upon millions of dollars at it because uh, it was a threat to the crops, the citrus crops there in Florida. So the honeybee, there's a lot at stake, right? With uh, at least the European honeybee, which is the honeybee we have for, for farms here. And they don't know any defense mechanism against a giant hornet like the Asian honeybees do. So because of that, that's one of the reasons we have a lot at stake that they're able to funnel a lot more money into stopping it before it spreads. You know, when you have something like the lionfish where it does affect smaller communities, coastal towns, but not so much the heart of America directly, it becomes a lot more challenging. But that is really, at least studies, now that we have more data and more years, that's really how you stop an invasive, invasion, invasive species is you have to get it right away and just throw everything at it. And it's working, it's working, you shouldn't. As of right now, you shouldn't be afraid of the Northern Hornet. Uh, <laughs> they got them under control. Okay, so the question was about uh, the northern giant hornet and uh, if it's eating other uh, hornets, bees, what have you. And interesting, we didn't keep many, one of the many things that ended up being on the cutting room floor. They did do a DNA analysis of its summit contents, and there was all sorts of things inside it, uh, including honeybees. But most surprisingly, uh, it found hamburger in the uh, in it. So they think that maybe it was like, you know, browsing a picnic ground or something. They don't really have an explanation, who knows? But there was definitely cow meat within the, the giant hornet. Uh, but once again, the whole idea of coevolution, it's remarkable, the European honeybees, how they ball against it, they suffocate it, they heat it up. It's because they co-evolve for thousands upon thousands, if not millions of years together as this like arms race, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this, you know, and then that's how survival happens, evolution adaptation. So, you know, now that the Northern giant hornet comes here, the European honeybee never had to face or see something. Like so eventually in theory, right, the, our honeybee would develop this, but we're talking once again, not in human time, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years for these processes to play themselves out and be behaviors that get passed on. Um, no, no, we do. Uh, so we can talk about, we have a project uh, in Shenandoah National Park where it's about, um, we've been filming there for four years, uh, uh, obviously off and on, and it's about cycles and life cycles. And it's, uh, for now, it's broken up into three parts. So the first part is about formations, uh, with the park being billions of years old, but it's also 2.0 of another mountain range, um, but then also the formation of the park. But then the second episode is about migrations. It focuses on all the birds, specifically the peregrine falcon, the monarch butterfly, the American eel, which has a remarkable story. And then the last one is about uh, life cycles and cycles themselves, like the water cycle and its importance. And so uh, we're really excited about it. It's, um, you know, it's a, it's a really epic when you have, when you have that much time, you know, to, to, to film, you can really craft some narratives. And we're hoping just like this, it will get people thinking in ways we were never thinking about how everything is interconnected and how the world, natural world kind of works, at least as far as we can understand it, not being scientists. You know, I mean, it's, it's what we produce. A lot of times we're just going through journals that are out there, nat nature journals. We're seeing what's out there and what's of interest to us. So it's, you know, I would just say, continue to find whatever is curious to you. Don't try to force it, but then, um, get in with a third party production company as um, you know, intern, a production assistant, and then just um, you know, like most jobs, work really hard and figure out if you like it or not. And if you don't get out real quick, 
because it can be really hard, uh, but it's also extremely rewarding, you know? So, okay, so third party is like, we're, so most, what you see on TV, like PBS, Nova, they don't actually have in-house production uh, companies. Some of them do. When I worked at National Geographic, we were a small in-house production producing content for National Geographic, but most everything that you see on TV, uh, it's produced by production companies that are private production companies. And then uh, we sell the content, they buy the content and then they sell subscriptions. It used to be commercials, you know, and that's mostly how it works. So if you ever see, you know, random names of in association with, you know, a film by all those are the actual companies that actually made the concept, made the, the film. All right. Okay. Well, thank you once again. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jeff, and to the Orange Frame team that's here tonight and to our audience. Uh, please come visit the Virginia Living Museum in Newport News. Our changing exhibit currently is called Mazes and Brain Games. We have an exhibit open downstairs called the Conservation Command Center. And we'll be opening uh, this weekend a exhibit in our Watson Education Center about humans and uh, effects on humans in space flight. Uh, and you can see a planetarium show while you're there also. Jeff, thank you. I'm, I was remiss in not mentioning you're also award-winning. Yeah, you got a new award, recent award, any award you want to talk about? Nominated for uh, the Writers Guild Association Award, which is, um, it's just like any award, it's not big anywhere else except for in the industry. <laughs> but it's big for writing, it's for this documentary. Uh, it's the only science documentary that's in there. We're up against like a Ken Burns uh, documentary and a couple of Frontline, a couple other PBS. So we'll see, March, six is the award ceremonies perfect okay also uh extremely talented and humble we appreciate your time thank you very very much all right good night